This is NDTV. And you're watching NDTV Prime. world that we are living in increasingly every day key decisions big decisions or even smaller ones for that matter are being taken on the back of data not for nothing is it said that we believe in god for everything else there is always data and uh, introducing uh, now on the panel a very special guest someone we've been trying to get on the program for you for a while now she's finally made time for us uh, prakalpa shankar co-founder at social cops a data intelligence company or a data and analytics startup uh, Prakalpa, thanks very much for speaking to us. As you were explaining to me earlier, for the benefit of our viewers, and I confess even me, to try and understand just what it is that we're looking at. In a country the size of India, with the number of challenges that we have, I guess increasingly we need data to figure out not just what they need, but also how to get the best outcomes. Is that a simple way to say where someone like you comes in? Pretty much. Um, so today we have decision makers being in one side inundated with reports mm. and data mm. uh, and on the other hand still being really blind to what is the most accurate decision that mm. I want to make. Mm. Um, in a country like India, uh, this becomes really hard because often a lot of data is still collected in paper reports. Mm. Uh, data that is still, you know, that is available online as in PDF files, unstructured local languages, terribly hard to make sense of. Mm. And inside an organization, uh, you have data that is in so much silos, your sales department, your marketing department, your finance department, these departments just never talk to each other, right? There's so many legacy systems that have been built. Mm. Uh, and so as a decision maker, when you, you know, as a leader, you want to say, this is what I need to do next. Mm. It's almost impossible to do that. Mm. Uh, that's really where an organization like Social Cops comes in mm. uh, and our platform comes in. So give us uh, like a real example. If say I wanted to, the example that you were giving earlier, X number of LPG cylinders need to make it to why part of India? Sure. So then they would come to you to say, help us identify households that perhaps need it. How do we get there? Help us identify exactly where to open up an I LPG see. center. So okay. I'll give you, I'll, I'll actually maybe go a little in depth into that mm -hmm. problem, right? So uh, say at a national level, you want to identify exactly where I want to open up LPG mm -hmm. centers. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal at this point in time for uh, the government of India was to be able to maximize access. So mm -hmm. they wanted to make sure that there is an LPG center within 10 kilometers of every Indian household. Okay. Uh, but we had to balance a couple of things. One is profitability mm -hmm. because uh, I'll Ultimately, Absolutely. the person running the center is a small entrepreneur, so him, right? you know they need to be able to be sustainable. Mm. On the other hand, for 1.3 billion Indian citizens, we need to make sure that there was a center within mm. 10 kilometers of their homes. Mm. Uh, so we started that problem statement. Uh, our platform kicks in there. So mm. we first went out and pulled all the market data that was available. So we essentially connected into the internal data systems of the oil companies. Mm. So information about sales, profitability, market data, mm. built a base layer of data through that. Mm. But market data was only going to care about profitability. That's right. It wouldn't ever put yeah. an LPG center mm. near, you know, 10 kilometer radius mm. of the remotest villages mm. in India. Mm. So that's where we went and pulled data from our public data repositories. So we mapped every one of India's 640,000 villages, mm. layered it with information like affluence and income, uh, and population and LPG penetration. Mm. Put all of that information together. Mm. Um, we realized after that that there's a data gap, which often happens in a country like India. Okay. Um, despite all these studies despite, and data and, despite and all Despite all of this, like, I mean, we Why is that? I want to spend a minute asking you why is that? Because we're not all the data sort of working at cross purposes, because we're looking at different things, because it's difficult to reconcile. Why is it like that? So often I think the way data is collected is a challenge, right? Mm. So what you choose to collect and I think this is a global problem. Often people, someone decides we will collect all this data. Mm. And then at some point someone says, I want to make these decisions of the data. Mm. And that entire process needs to be flipped, which is really what data intelligence is about. Like mm. you start at the decision and say, these are the decisions I need to make. Mm. And work backwards and say, this is the data I need to collect to make that decision instead of just collecting mm. data at random, right? Mm. And and often that's, that's what happens. So in, you end up collecting a lot of data. Mm but that's not really helping you make the final decision that you want to make. I see. I want to ask you now, you know, the, the, perhaps a more uh, obvious question, and I did toy with the idea of beginning with this or not, but I'm glad that you've explained what you do here. Why did you get into data 
and analytics as your startup? Because you know, when you started out, perhaps there was the big banner headlines were taken by the so-called more glamorous ideas and, and, and all of that. You know, so how data? I think when we started Social Cops, we didn't actually start saying we want to build a data intelligence company. Uh, we started saying we want to drive decisions that matter. Uh, so my co-founder Varun and I were working at investment banks at that point. Uh, the finance world is a place where you see how data is used every second for both important and not so important decisions, right? Uh, but what about other worlds? Like, I mean, a national level healthcare budget allocation or, you know, a crime or... Um, these are places where data just isn't used in the same way. Mm. Um, and that's really where we started. Like we wanted to bring the same precision that we see in the online world mm. uh, to the developing world mm. um, to solve for, you know, big data problems. And what's problems. the response been like? I think it's been extremely encouraging. Um, we've grown significantly over the last three years. Um, I remember when our first pilot, we were essentially able to drive a decision that affected the lives of mm. five people. Mm. Um, and since then, we've, uh, today our platform is used um, by about 150 organizations in seven countries. Um, we're the data intelligence platform for um, uh, uh, for the government of India when they're essentially giving out subsidies to five crore below poverty line women. Mm. Uh, so we've been able to see rapid scale. Mm. Uh, we've been able to hopefully drive some really, really big decisions mm. out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that way, and I think there's an entire movement mm. that's happening globally. You're, you're getting right? a sense of that as, uh, as well. I think, I think, so two, two and a half years ago, I, I have gone into meetings and actually explained to people why it's important to make data-driven decisions. I don't need to do that anymore. I see. Uh, and I think that is they fundamentally the key. biggest. Absolutely. I think it begins from sort of respecting data and, exactly. and, and the need exactly. to have these analytics. Now, you know, uh, both you and Varun were studying in Singapore when, you know, and then you went on to work there and then this is where the idea came up. Tell me, what did that education or your time in Singapore bring to the table? How did that contribute into making you your startup, which perhaps is different from what you got in India? Um, I think uh, Singapore was great, I think, for both Varun and me, just in terms of the kind of exposure that we got. So both of us got scholarships to go study in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think before that, at least for me, uh, I was kind of on my path to the very, very traditional uh, Indian middle class, you know, success story, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I will finish my engineering, engineering I will yeah. work in a, you know, in McKinsey for two years yeah. and then I will go to Harvard Business School and you know, do an MBA yeah. and then figure out what I want to do in my life. Um, Not just Indian middle class, it's very bright Indian middle class, <laughs> let's just say that, let's just put that studious, out there, but yes. Studious, geeky Indian middle yeah. class, but um, uh, that was really the path that I was on and that's what I thought was success. Mm. Um, what Singapore gave me was it gave me the ability to explore what that life would look like mm. even while I was in college. So I did a lot of that. I did research under, you know, like, you know, for an entire year under an MIT TR35 prof. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, worked at, you know, Goldman Sachs. I realized what that life looks like. And it wasn't uh, for you. And I realized that it doesn't make sense anymore in the kind of world that we live in mm. to spend five years trying to just get more things on my resume and then figure out at 30 what I really want to do with my life. Like, I think the world has dramatically changed. 20 years ago, it made sense to go to a Harvard because that's where networks were built mm -hmm. and that's where you could essentially, you know, and those networks made you successful in life. Today, you have LinkedIn and Twitter. If you want to reach out to someone and you're doing good work, it is not difficult anymore, right? And, and in real time also, it's, it's all possible in real yeah. time. But did you have to convince the folks about your decision? What was that like? <laughs> uh, my parents were actually very supportive. Actually, both Varun and my, both, both our parents were very supportive. Uh, my mom wanted to be an entrepreneur when she was 21. I see. And um, her family at that point basically said, uh, if you go do this, walk out of the house, don't come back. Mm -hmm. um, she now is an entrepreneur. Oh, I but see. That's, okay. uh, 20 really years, in the family. But that's 20 years later. Um, and so uh, both our parents were very supportive about kind of going out following your dreams. But we were also very practical about it. So one of the things that we didn't want to do is after we graduated and kind of supported ourselves through university, we didn't want to like ask our parents to support us while sure. we do a startup, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we spent our final year taking part in uh, business plan competitions around mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. raised about $25,000 of funding through that, mm -hmm. uh, which was basically prize money. Mm -hmm. 
so that became enough for us to kind of come back to india and spend about a year in pilots mm. uh, and we also gave ourselves that that buffer so what we told our you know our families were give us this one year mm. and if you know at the end of all of that if we, if we don't figure anything out then we'll mm. go back and get a job you know sure. so i think it's also about so do you think entrepreneurs should have this kind of plan b uh, in their heads you know that if it, try it for a while at least do your bit be prepared for what you're trying to do try it for a while and then if it doesn't work out we'll we'll go back i mean but how much of that plan b did you sort of really think or was it is it only that moment and this at hand and then we'll worry about everything later I where do you get the confidence from is what i'm trying to ask for kalpa that you know great if it works and you know don't worry i'm confident of making it i think plan b's are like useful just to kind of tell everybody else that mm. you know we have a plan b yeah. um i think at least for for me like you know when we started like uh, you you don't you, there's very little that you can see outside of it and it's yeah. it's ultimately about being like you are in the moment and you're doing everything you can to make your dreams come true and uh, i think it's a very different feeling like mm-hmm. it at some point when you find that one thing then you you really want it to work yeah. uh, so you know two months into like doing this i remember my dad calling me and saying I can never imagine you going back you know <laughs> <laughs> uh just because of the sheer excitement and you know and you go through your ups and downs like crazy ups crazy downs mm. but at at some point I think you you realize what it is and I think ultimately um ultimately at the end of it i think it's important to have some level of practicality at the back of it like you know you you should know that it's and I think it helps you be a better entrepreneur like you don't make stupid decisions mm-hmm. you make the right decisions you have to weigh out your risks in mm-hmm. you know in in terms of even as an organization uh in what you do so what's what's been the most frustrating part of the journey so far in the, in the last four odd years and what's been the most challenging i think one of the things that is very different about us as a as an organization is that we've 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 spent an inordinate amount of time focusing on culture and people mm-hmm. um so we care a lot about everybody walking into the door as an entrepreneur mm-hmm. uh not as an employee mm-hmm. uh we you know so we have we've had people move over from all over the world we have you know americans and you know um uh, people from england who moved moved over to delhi to work mm-hmm. towards that same common goal and um one of the things that really matters to us is that the first 100 people who join us mm. they join us for that final overall vision mm. uh, that we are all trying to work towards uh, i think at that point in time like being able to like you know find the right people and right. ensure that you are then building ways for them to grow in the organization i think that is something that we've we've pers- it's it i i wouldn't say it's been it's been challenging yeah. uh, it's also been equally rewarding because mm-hmm. you know then when every every new person who walks into the door there right. is so much excitement from our side that right. you know hey this person is going to contribute sure. so much to the sure. company but but sure. um we've taken this slightly harder road you know like uh, you know companies all around us have basically mass hired and you know you you see people kind of wanting to scale really fast mm. and we can do that if we want to but we've chosen not to um just because we 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 care about the ethos of of the company